So this, of course, topic tonight is on the invasive uh, leaf hopper that we call the spotted lanternfly. And again, if you're not familiar with spotted lanternfly, this is a species that is endemic or native to um, southern China and parts of Vietnam. It is actually, I think, when it reaches its adult stage, and even that third instar stage, it's actually a, a, a really good looking uh, insect. I mean, it is pretty, as you can see there with its wings spread open. I think it is. Some people often mistake this uh, species with um, moths or uh, butterflies, but it, it is not. And we'll, we'll talk about all the specifics of its ecology here in a minute. But when it was first discovered, it was like the, um, it was the apocalypse that was essentially forecasted for not just our ecosystems, but especially for agriculture because there is substantial concern that this um, new invasive species, and we, as you probably well know, we've had uh, a fair share in the last, say, 40 years come through here, Western PA, everything from what used to be known as gypsy moths, now known as spongy moth. Uh, we, of course, had the um, emerald ash borer that really killed a substantial number of ash trees, not just in Western Pennsylvania, but in Eastern North America. And then we've had the brown marmorated stink bug, which is also an invasive and clearly also uh, seemed like it was gonna cause some serious problems. And then going into the past with trees, right? We've had the, um, the chestnut blight, which also came from China that killed over four and a half billion American chestnut trees to now there's oak wilt and thousand canker and a whole host of things that are uh, invasive, um, invasive species, be it insects or fungus, that has really reshaped a lot of our ecosystems. So it looked really, really almost apocalyptic with the spotted lanternfly. But as we'll see, it may be not be as bad as we originally thought, which is great. So with that said, I'm required, as we always are, to, if you're not as familiar with us here at the Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania, just to give you a little background on us if this is your first time joining us. If you have had to sit through this before, know a lot about us here at Audubon, I apologize. Um, but we have been around since 1916, right? And our uh, mission here is to connect people to birds and nature through our programs, projects, and places. Uh, we focus around seven counties of southwestern Pennsylvania with Pittsburgh as our nexus, mostly Allegheny County and Butler, but certainly we hit these other counties as well, right? Hopefully you have gone to all of our um, reserves and parks and sanctuaries. Uh, those are really, uh, I think, where most of us congregate when we are doing programs or we're having people buy native plants from us. We have four public uh, properties, four non-public properties, essentially have 467 uh, acres owned, mansion number uh, about 132. And Certainly, uh, we have easements and over 12 and a half miles of trails, right? So each year, we think we get about 60,000 visitors. So this is, of course, very important to us. And this is my focus here. So again, if you joined us late, my name is Chris Kubiak. I'm the Director of Education here at Audubon. Um, and we do a whole host of programs. I'm really one of the, the bird guys and the native plant guys, but we do everything uh, as you see there below. So, And then lastly, our projects, right? We really have focused on um, some real specific species from chimney swifts, putting up chimney swift towers, and of course, monarchs and other pollinators, and then reforesting uh, a number of different places along creeks and farms to provide habitat, carbon sequestration, and a whole host of other things like erosion control. So, all right, <clears throat> let's move into the main topic at hand at night. Um, what is the spotted lanternfly? And a spotted lanternfly is an introduced and an invasive insect that has been spreading throughout Pennsylvania, right? And again, we want to make that description that this is an invasive species as well. It's a non-native invasive species. There are some species of insects or plants that are non-native that do not become invasive. And that's a really important um, I think description and divider between the threats that invasives play versus non-natives. With plants, right, we know that, of course, things like daffodils and, and um, tulips are non-native in the plant world, but they are not invasive, right? So that is the problem. We'll talk about what makes the spotted lanternfly so invasive and potentially 
um, such a destructive pest in really targeted areas of our agriculture in Pennsylvania, of course, in North America. So what you see when you are looking here at a spotted lanternfly, you are seeing one of the largest, what we call a plant hopper. And this includes our native leaf hoppers that you may have seen here in Western PA. Usually they're little and green, um, maybe not even a centimeter in length, sometimes a little bit more. We have a number of different plant or leaf hopper species that, that we've encountered or you have encountered maybe in your own yards. And this is a larger family that is known as uh, Fulgoridae, which goes way back. We believe in it has origins uh, even before the dinosaurs until this particular species maybe emerged in its modern form about, I'd say, 10 to 15 million years after the extinction of the dinosaurs. So it has been around very, very long with its origin in southern China. That's where this insect originated. And that's what is also the key to why this thing, when it arrived here in North America, has spread like wildfire and has that sort of invasive tag. This in biology is what is known as ecological release in the fact that a new or novel uh, insect or organism has no controls from the ecosystem placed on it. So it expands um, in humongous numbers, right? We went through that with uh, COVID, right? It was a new and novel disease that uh, our bodies hadn't adjusted to and insects and, and other diseases do similar type things. So the spotted lanternfly, what it is, is being a plant hopper, it is a true bug, which means it has six legs in a mouth part that is known as a proboscis. And a proboscis is essentially a straw-like appendage that is attached to the spotted lanternfly's mouth. And they insert them into the cambium, which is the living part of plants and trees. And like a, a straw will suck up those sugary juices that the plant is creating through photosynthesis, right? So they feed on that uh, sap, that sugary sap that is flowing through the plants from over 70 plus different plant species. But as we have learned here, it definitely has um, favorites within that world. And one in particular that is its main favorite that we think may even absolutely be the precursor for this species to uh, reproduce here in um, the uh, North American continent here. So these particular being plant hoppers, they are weak flyers, even though they do have wings, but they have incredibly strong legs that they can jump pretty far distances and then sort of glide with their wings to get out of trouble. So like all plant hoppers, and like the name suggests, they hop off of plants when they either feel um, endangered from, from something that wants to eat them or harm them, or if they want to spread and move from where they grew when they were in their um, earlier stages as instars, and then of course spread the species uh, as the females lay eggs. So they can move as much as a mile to two miles away just on their own in favorable conditions. Everybody gets freaked out. Um, I've been to sporting events in Pittsburgh and other events down in Pittsburgh when they first hit their massive numbers last summer. And while there, you'll get three or four landing on you, people freak out, but they cannot hurt you in any way. They do not bite or sting. That proboscis that they have does not hurt you. So most of it is more just an annoyance than anything else. So. And they also, lastly here, they really like to congregate in large numbers with each other. They don't, they're not solitary. This is probably an adaptive behavior that they use to maximize the ability to survive. So if there's a pest like a bird or some other animal, then that way there's kind of safety in numbers. So the probability that you're going to get eaten goes way down. Okay. So why isn't the spotted lanternfly a problem in its native range in uh, southern China and also in northern and other parts of Vietnam? Well, let's talk about that, right? And that goes back to some basics in biology, which I've already mentioned. We're going to talk about this that is known as ecological release. So it is an invasive species in Japan and South Korea as well. Uh, we do know when it was introduced in South Korea in 2006 and then Japan in 2009, it became a gigantic problem for um, South Korea's peach and grape industry. And this is why we were incredibly worried here in North America because of what we saw and what, what they experienced there. 
um, it caused substantial decline in death of particularly grapes, but also a lot of stone fruit like peaches and cherries um, and various things that are related uh, in that larger uh, rubus family. So think of it, the rose family there, right? And that was a major, major problem. Now, again, Japan and South Korea are relatively close to China. It spread there through trade. Um, it hitched rides probably on all sorts of different uh, imports of it could be everything from rock to wood to even food from China and then spread throughout there. We think how it came to the United States, it originated in Berks County, we think as, as late as 2011, but it possibly could be even as early as 2009 or 2008. It came over in an egg mass from China in rocks that landscapers were using out in Berks County. And of course, it, it, it's very difficult to spot it when it is on rock because it simply sometimes looks like rock, right? So in China, where the spotted lantern fly is native, it has long evolved with other natural predators, right? And we're going to talk about some of them, these specific, what's called brachinoid wasps. So these are predatory wasps that they make their living in laying their eggs and preying upon the spotted lantern fly and doing a substantial amount of killing spotted lantern flies and keeping their numbers in a sort of equilibrium within their larger ecosystem. So if you think about this, the spotted lantern flies have been around in China and Vietnam for about 55 million years. They've had a long period of time to find other animals that like to eat them, birds, of course, recognize them and eat them there in China. So it keeps their numbers smaller and in relatively manageable populations where they really don't do any uh, damage. However, here in the US, they are a new and novel organism. Again, this idea of ecological release, this idea that they are released with no natural predators. There's nothing to keep them in check um, there's nothing to keep their numbers naturally down. So they explode exponentially and each year continue to just grow more and more and more, right? So there's also on top of that many suitable plant hosts and particularly the main one that they are tied to, what you may have heard before of a tree called Tree of Heaven or Alanthus, right? Which was brought over in the late 18th century. This is spread throughout a lot of our waste areas and roads and, um, you know, places that were once industry that now have been overgrown. Tree of Heaven loves to take over those places. And so that has provided a lot of those plants, um, plants that they need to go through their life cycle. In the city of Pittsburgh, if you live down there in parts of Allegheny County, you may have noticed a, uh, another invasive plant that seems to be taking over everything, and that is known as porcelain berry. Porcelain berry is in the grape family, though we cannot actually eat the berries ourselves, but birds love it. After Tree of Heaven, I have noticed in observing it in our area the last four years, that seems to be their second favorite host. They love this particular invasive. And because it's everywhere, the, uh, the um, species of spotted lanternfly, of course, are everywhere as well. So there are some signs that our native species are starting to adapt. So spiders certainly eat and have continued to eat spot and lantern flies as they either get caught in their webs or you get individual predatory spiders. They're nothing that can really put a dent in their population. Some praying mantises, which the ones we have in Western Pennsylvania are not native to North America, they're Chinese. They eat them back in China, so they seem to have adapted well. And then lastly, finally, we're starting to notice some bird species who did not eat them at first and have been shown when they enter new areas, birds don't know what they are and don't really eat them. Back now where we've had spotted lantern flies for over 10 years, the birds have definitely adapted and have begun to eat this species in mass. So species like Carolina wrens and tufted of tip mice and Carolina and black cap chickadees have all started to really eat this species, which is a great sign. So we're still not at that point here in Western PA. The last year at Beechwood, I did observe some birds eating, uh, particularly tip mice eating them as well. So as a result, like I said, it's taking a while for our um, predators of this species to catch up and it makes for a problematic population. So there is literally, um, billions upon billions of these uh, insects without anything to really keep them in check, for at least right now. 
here is a map. This is the most updated. So what happened um, when the spotted lanternfly was first discovered, you could see out there in the east at Berks County, and then it spread to Chester and Montgomery and uh, Lehigh counties. They put a quarantine, which means, right, you cannot move any plant or wood material out of the county to another county without a special permit. So the idea was to at least initially stop the spread of the spotted lanternfly. But we think at that point, when it was first really discovered and the quarantines were first put on, it had already largely escaped those areas and have already been spreading without people really noticing. And it, it essentially is not going to stop at all the eventual spread of the spotted lanternfly across Pennsylvania. But really, this species will most likely overtake all of North America, um, even into parts of Canada. We are still unsure how far north it's going to be able to go, um, but it will eventually be endemic across North America. California is particularly worried, probably um, California and New York, because of their um, large viticulture or grape culture that they have there. This pest, it can be extremely damaging to grapes, which we'll talk a little bit more about. As you can see here in Western Pennsylvania, Allegheny County was put on as well as Beaver on the quarantine in 2001. We are almost certain that it spread primarily through our trains and train tracks coming from Eastern Pennsylvania and the lanternfly adults would hitch rides or they would lay their eggs on some of these trains, which would then be parked in Western Pennsylvania. And then they hatched from there. Uh, the first accounts that I had heard of them in Western PA and particularly Allegheny County was 2019 and 2020 during the, uh, the whole lockdown thing, they began to emerge you know, for the first time in larger numbers. Butler County, we just started to experience them in uh, Cranberry and a few other places here in Butler. Uh, I noticed a Moraine State Park last year on that tree of heaven. I, I noticed the first few. So they are here and they're rapidly moving north following 79 and 80 um, up, up to Erie. I bet you they're in Erie and Crawford County, um, which is also worrying a lot of the um, vineyards up in that area, whether it's Welch's or some of the um, wine producing uh, vineyards there. So that is going to be a major, major problem for them. So. It is a pretty much statewide pest at this point. And you can see, right, this is as of this past January, it is spreading out of its original nexus of Berks County there and has overtaken all of New Jersey, Delaware, into most parts of now Maryland. It's moved down into the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, which also has a lot of fruit growing, particularly grapes and apples, into the Carolinas. And then you see a few other spots westward. Most of this is from um, them hitching rides again on trains, but also cars. And we're going to talk about that because hopefully this summer you and I'm going to try to convince you to at least check your vehicles from about late July into August all the way into October, because this is how they are hitching rides to other states and other areas and then spreading that way. So what does quarantine mean, of course? So it is this is essentially coming out of the state laws in Pennsylvania. It shall be unlawful for any person knowingly to permit any plant pest so declared to exist on his or her premises to either sell, offer for sale, give away, or move any plants, plant products, and other material capable of harboring the pest, right? So if you grow plants and sell plants like we do at Audubon, right? We, we sell native plants. We have a special spotted lantern fly permit um, that we have to go through a number of different protocols to check the plants, make sure they're, if we're shipping them to another area, that they're, um, you know, of course, are not adults or egg masses in there. And it takes a substantial amount of time. This summer, Beechwood is now hitting that, you know, explosion of lanternflies, and we are noticing a ton of them in our uh, Audubon Center for Native Plant Area, where we grow a lot of these plants. So it is a big job trying to make sure that these, these guys are not hitching rides to other places. So you can get a checklist if you're really interested in trying to at least knock their numbers down near where you live. Um, and sometimes at least, and I remember when, when the um, 
brown marmorated stink bug really became a big deal about 12, 13 years ago. It felt like that Greek myth of Sisyphus where you're pushing the rock up for eternity. And right when you think you get them in control, they just come in from somewhere else, right? It does feel that way in some spots with the spotted lanternfly. However, here's the good news. They have shown that if we continue to either squish them on site and in the, the cooler months, look and scrape the egg masses, you can do uh, a really big part in keeping their numbers at least down a little bit more manageable numbers, right? Um, so that is a, a really important thing. You're gonna feel overwhelmed, I think, especially if you're in the city of Pittsburgh because of all of the tree of heaven that's down there. Um, even in Cranberry, I've seen large numbers of these because again, lots of tree of heaven along 79, but keep killing them and squishing them. Um, and also looking for those egg uh, mass locations. And you can see, I mean, it can be anywhere, right? So lo outdoor light bulbs, outdoor furniture, fence posts, um, on tires, believe it or not. Um, sometimes on the outside, but even harder, sometimes on the inside, all sorts of out of sight areas. So this fall and winter, if you've got nothing to do and you wanna really search them out from your property or around where you live, uh, this is a great um, checklist to have, right? You can see there on the left, the life stages of this species, right? Starting as an egg mass, um, when it's first fresh, it's nice and white, but once it dries, it almost looks like paste or some kind of like brown or mud that is smeared on a branch or a post or something like that. And these early stage nymphs in their instars or, or life stage, they start to hatch out in late April. They look like almost like this zebra black and white. And then later before they turn to adults, you see that red. And then lastly, they're starting in late July, you know, all the way here into potentially December if we have a warm fall, which seems to get warmer and warmer every year with climate change, right? Um, you can have them as well. So um, keep looking for them. So just to reiterate a little bit more, this is sort of the time frame of the life cycle um, and different sort of stages throughout the year in which you can uh, essentially try to keep their numbers in some manageable numbers around where you live and in your yard. You can see the egg laying starts in the fall and over winter, as we mentioned, right? Um, those eggs are out there. They can survive temperatures that are pretty cold because China also, even where these uh, species live, they can get some colder weather, but they are really susceptible to temperatures that start to drop below zero. And I just read something today. I was reading a scientific article that shows, and maybe it's gonna limit their spread northwards is that they have very, very high mortality in their eggs when temperatures drop below minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, it's been a long time since we've had temperatures like that. And I suspect with climate change, those things are probably gonna be the um, in the past, but um, that can potentially control them as they spread further north, right? Throughout the rest of the life cycle from hatch all the way to when they're adults, you can kill them or squish them. And, and I am going to mention some easier ways to do that and some things that you definitely should not do. And there's still a lot of misinformation about um, how to control them out there. Um, the worst thing you could possibly do is, is use sticky traps because it has killed a large number of birds and also some mammals like smaller squirrels, baby squirrels. They get stuck on these sticky traps and with birds it is a death sentence, right? So we really want to stress that that is not really a best practice for controlling uh, the species here, right? So let's take a closer look at these egg masses. And this is a tree of heaven that the, the adult female, you can see that on the bottom right, those are the eggs when they are first laid. So she can lay anywhere between 30 and 50. They almost look like brown seeds that are arranged in vertically in columns, right? Now, she also puts that prote a protective cover over them that as they age, almost looks like a gray mud or plaster. And then they start to kind of crack. That's where the, uh, especially in late winter, the freeze thaw, they start to almost look like someone smeared mud on a tree there, right? Um, so these are roughly about three to four inches wide, two inches long. I have found that they're relatively easy to spot anywhere where there's tree of heaven. And if you don't know what Tree of Heaven looks like, you can either look it up online or Atlantis, which is its other name, or you can use apps like Seek or iNaturalist to get an ID because that's where we, I mostly have found them. Almost 90% of the time, they are 
either on or very nearby trees heaven because that again that is going to be their main host that they're using here and, and tree of heaven is as i mentioned right is native to china so they also sometimes confuse some folks there. You can see the one on the, the very top left is the um, egg mass, but some people gypsy moth or, or spongy moth as it is now known. Sometimes some folks get confused with that. Um, believe it or not, lichen sometimes just confuses some folks that aren't as, um, I think, uh, aware of, of nature, maybe like some of you. But this one, the mud dauber nest, which is a really cool type of wasp species, that one I could definitely see, right? I mean, that definitely has a mud look to it, but it is definitely not the spotted lanternfly egg mass. So here's some of our identification, and maybe you've seen these around your yard or anywhere in Western Pennsylvania where this species is now growing um, in humongous numbers, right? So the, the little small black and white or spotted white uh, is what is known as the first through third in stars. Right. And, you know, again, this instars is essentially stages of insect species here. And so this runs from about Western PA here about early May through about early July. So you think about July 4th. And they are black and white with spots uh, and grow to be about about a fourth an inch. When you see them, they tend to have the, they'll, they'll be on a vine or a branch and they tend to like to try to go on the back side so you can't see them. And you'll often see them clustered with sometimes three or four. And I've seen a beach with this summer as many as 30 or 40 on a single branch, right? And they all try to kind of work together to hide behind that branch. This next and last instar stage, which you can see these from July, which I saw uh, three of them today in my yard on my grape uh, vines, last from early, early July through actually early September. And are red now instead of black with additional black and white spots and are about to say, you know, a half an inch. They are, they are substantially larger than some of those other instars stages that you see earlier in the year. So some of the lookalikes that people get confused with and some of these, it's okay. You can see the, the spotted lanternfly there is in the very middle. So the um, first through third instars, you can see the little black and white, and then the, the latter third to fourth instar stage with the red one there. But those others around the perimeter of that, the larger squares are lookalikes that are not uh, spotted lanternflies. So the very top one is your brown marmorated stink bug when it's in its nymph stage. And uh, you can kill those to your heart's content if you so choose, because they too are an invasive species. But they, we think, are going the same path that we, we hope and we think we're seeing in, in uh, the places where spotted lanternfly first emerged, that they are not a major problem anymore. Uh, I remember when I first started at Beachwood, there was hundreds and hundreds of them in our offices everywhere. Now you only see a, a handful. And that's because the natural predators in Western Pennsylvania have adapted and have kept their numbers down. The rest that you see around there, there's milkweed bugs that you see there in the top right, and then box elder bugs, right, on the bottom left and right. Certainly not spotted lantern flies, and we don't want you killing either one of those two species, right? So the adults. So let's talk about the adults here. They're, um, I think, again, very striking in their patterns. There is nothing else in Western PA that I think, and I'll show you some lookalikes here in a second, that you're really going to confuse this species with. Plus, for a plant hopper, they are quite large, right? So they are about an inch long and about a half an inch wide at rest. And they are mostly sort of a lighter gray when you see them when they are perched. The forewing is gray with black spots. The wingtips have what's called um, reticulates. They almost look like a brick pattern, right? So black blocks that, that look like bricks on top of that there. Their hind wings that they, they have have patches of red and black with a white band between them. The legs and head are black as well. And the abdomen is yellow with a broad black wing that you see on there. So adult lookalikes. Um, there are some species um, that look like them as well. So we've got Elanthus webworm. Uh, we've got Cerocropia moss there that you can see on the bottom. The webworm, the Elanthus webworm is on the far right. And then the tiger moth, which I think would be the probably the one that you would most confuse 
with uh, an adult spotted lantern fly, but that is that is a moth that boy, you, if you see, consider yourself lucky because that is not a very common species to see here. So I truly think it's really hard to confuse this um, with anything else here that you're gonna see. And especially once we hit August and in, in, uh, September and October, when you're out and about in urban areas, they will be everywhere. And those other three species that they somewhat superficially look like them, are not going to uh, be out in huge masses there as well. So let's talk about their preferred hosts in order of their um, their their preference, right? This gives me the chills, and at least did when I first saw this picture there. So you can see in the bottom there that is a looks like a red delicious apple tree with thousands, hundreds, and thousands of spotted lanternfly adults feeding on that tree. This is in, um, I believe, either Berks or Lancaster County circa 2016. So some of you may know this, but some of you that don't know me uh, probably don't. But when I'm not doing this at Audubon, I have eight acres of apple trees. So I'm an apple farmer. And that's what we were substantially thus in the apple and other fruit growing field. This past seemed to be like uh, the zombie apocalypse from hell. Because when you see that and you know they're feeding on that tree, all of those apples are going to drop. Um, the tree is going to wilt, and uh, it could potentially either kill the tree, or at least we thought, because it did this in um, in South Korea and also parts of Japan. Um, but right, they have a much higher preference than apples. You can see, as I've already mentioned, tree of heaven or lanthus is what these. Um, particular species not only want but they need to be successful. We think both tree of heaven and then grape species both our native wild grapes or cultivated grapes and then the porcelain berry make up the second most important of their host species and uh, followed very closely behind by black walnut but especially black walnut saplings. That is what um, you see, and that's our only native tree that we tend to see them in numbers like that, right? But going down, they can do some damage on maples, sugar maples, as well as red maples, birch trees, and then apples, peaches, and other stone fruits. So um, this is where we see, but that's only the tip of the iceberg, as I mentioned, right? 70 plus different hosts that they can actually use. I mean, look at this tree here on the left. This is Berks County. That looks again like something out of some kind of apocalypse movie, I think. Um, just unbelievable the amount of that spotted lantern flies on this tree here. So some of the damage they do environmental, right? So adults and immatures both damage host plants by feeding on the sap from uh, stems and trunks of trees through that uh, piercing mouth part that we call the proboscis, right? And that's key to all leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, even our native ones. Trees, vines, crops, and many other types of plants may be found with sap weeping from wounds, wilting, leaf curling, and dieback, right, which has been observed uh, in places that have had these numbers for a number of years. From a crop standpoint, outside of just those, they love soybeans and ca can cause some serious and did cause serious damage to soybeans in eastern Pennsylvania, but also parts of South Korea, um, Japan, as well as China where um, China, even though this species originated from, the Chinese had long sprayed indiscriminately pesticides that killed off a lot of their hosts. So they would have outbreaks of the spotted lantern flies in a few areas um, because those, those insect species that were trying, that normally uh, depended upon them had been all killed off, right? So this is important though, and this was not what we originally thought when it was first um, observed out east and then spreading here to Western PA. Based on our best scientific current understanding, the spotted lanternfly is more of a plant stressor rather than a plant killer, right? And that's very important because it was viewed at first through the experiences in South Korea as a plant killer. Healthy trees seem to survive. They bounce back the next year. They get enough energy before the spotted lanternfly gets in huge numbers, and then they are, you know, um, pulled back a bit, but they seem to bounce back. Occasionally, we've noticed mortality to the tree of heaven, which is not a bad thing. Um, it 
In fact, some of us thought, hey, maybe this there's the side benefit of having this number of spotted lanternflies, since Tree of Heaven is their, their prime host, maybe it'll kill a lot of our invasive uh, Tree of Heaven. And then that way, right, it'll kill two birds with one stone by killing Tree of Heaven, which is incredibly invasive. It's also going to knock the numbers of this species back, right? But it hasn't happened to the extent that we've thought. But also grapevines, and it has um, killed some smaller black walnut saplings. I've noticed in my yard, they also really like the black walnut, okay? The other problem is what's called honeydew. All leaf hoppers, not just the spotted lantern fly, when they're feeding on these sugary parts of the sap that's flowing through the cambium of the tree or vine or whatever they're feeding upon, they don't digest all of the sugar. And this is aphids do this. This is why um, ants love to be around aphids. Um, other leaf hoppers do the same thing. So they excrete what's called honeydew, which is essentially their poop that still has a high amount of sugar in it. So it's a sticky, sugary substance, which again, hopefully you, you haven't uh, or you've already eaten, right? But it's essentially their, their uh, excrement or their poop, right? What happens, so when you get such large numbers, this honeydew builds up below where these um, insects are feeding, it will attract large numbers of bees like honeybees, wasps, and other insects that are eating the sugar. And I, I, I'm going to, maybe some of you already know this, there is actually honey, spotted lanternfly honeydew honey, because honeybees love to get it and they make a very unique tasting honey out of it. So um, I've tried it. I'll try anything at least once. And I'll be honest with you, if you get past what it is, it's actually really good. So to each their own, right? I mean, maybe we'll try, try to make uh, lemons out of lemonade. But when you get all the sugar, especially in warm conditions, that leads to mold. And it leads to a specific species called sooty mold that turns black underneath there. It can be an eyesore, it smells bad. It can be really hard to remove. If it gets in large enough numbers on the leaves and turns black, it can reduce photosynthesis and actually, again, cause more stress to trees and saplings and ultimately stress the tree as well. Um, the economic risk, um, again, this is going to be reassessed since we've learned more information here about them, but potentially we were worried that it would cost somewhere over the long term in North America, and this is not um, just in Pennsylvania, about $16.4 billion worth of damage, specifically on maples and cherries, um, but grapes is where, this is where the, the news has not changed, grapes are still its major, major agricultural um, pests that it'll, it has done and will continue to do major damage on. Apples, um, not so much, thankfully. Thank God they don't seem to have done much, if at all, any damage to apples. Peaches, same thing. Um, and then lastly, nursery and landscape. So all of these things minus grapes are probably going to be pushed substantially down. Uh, conversely, grapes will be pushed substantially up. That has led to the um, major loss of grapes. So if you wanted to start a, a vineyard or want to get into the wine industry, or you just like growing uh, grapes to eat, you need to really seriously consider a strategy to control them because they will rapidly kill your grapes. Um, tourism, state game lands, right? And most of this is just the sooty mold, right? PA ecosystems we thought were going to be um, a major problem, but they are not. Property values and damage, right? Um, all of these other things that affect your quality of life. Essentially, there's nothing great when you're sitting um, at a cafe or restaurant open air down in the city of Pittsburgh and five, six, 10 jump into your food while you're eating, which has happened to me. I was at a pit football game last year and eating nachos and two of them jumped into my nacho cheese. So um, while that's not the end of the world, right? Certainly it, it's not great to have that, that large numbers of them. Here's where some really cool new research just hot off the presses that when I've done this program in the past, as well as some of our other experts at Audubon that focus on this species, um, this was in its early stages, but there are some really, really great news coming out about natural pests that are wasp, two wasp species in particular, that in China are parasitic to them, which means they sting them and lay their eggs in both the spotted lantern flies eggs, as well as the nymphs, 
and the ones that are primarily responsible for keeping them in check in their numbers in their native uh, uh, ecosystems in China, right? So one of the most promising is this first one, and I'll probably mangle the scientific name, but Dryenus sinicus, right, is a parasitic wasp that tackles juvenile lantern flies, right, with its saber-like foreclaws. And what it does is it pins them down, so it feeds on them a little bit and then lays its eggs inside them. Yeah, parasitic wasps are something out of uh, a horror movie uh, <laughs> because they are scary. They, they will sometimes... Um, sort of sting and then paralyze their prey. And then while their prey is paralyzed, their babies eat them from the inside out, right? Which sounds pretty gruesome, but it definitely keeps them in check. The other one, Anastatus orientalis, is another parasitic wasp from China that focuses specifically on the later instar stages, right? So you've got these two that work in tandem. Now they have been studying them in uh, USDA research laboratories, as well as a number of other universities. And they wanna make sure that they, if we do introduce them to control this spotted lanternfly um, uh, species here, that they're not gonna cause other problems to our ecosystems. Cause there's a lot of times where we brought non-native species in to control something else and it becomes even worse than what they were um, brought into control, right? The best news that has just come out that it showed that it has absolutely seemingly no impact to any other native species in North America. They are so and have evolved to be so specific to spotted lantern flies. That's all they care about. So there's really strong evidence, I think, starting this year and next, they're going to be re, um, introduced into our ecosystems in large numbers to keep uh, the spotted lantern fly down. So that, that's looking very positive here. And also in places in Eastern PA, there are, they had found just recently, um, within the last couple of years, two species of native fungal pathogens, right? Um, I can try to pronounce this again, I'll mangle it, but the Beovaria bassiana and um, Batoka, and these funguses attack and kill the spotted lanternfly. The spores get on them and kill them at all stages, which it could, you know, how evolution is always, uh, finding new and novel ways to uh, take advantage of other uh, species that it, it, it feeds upon. Maybe that's another one that we can use in this fight against them. So, and here is the uh, dry, dryness species um, from China. The main one you could see there on the on D there, the far right, it has pinned one of them down and it's, it's laying its eggs inside the um, its host. Um, and you can see the female is there in A, she does all the laying, but the males also will feed upon them as well. And then C, you can see the eggs and then sort of the emerging um, uh, larvae that are eating that nymph from the inside out. Um, gruesome stuff, right? Steps to control spotted lanternfly in our management, right? So we have, as we mentioned, the quarantine is to stop the spread and then scrape eggs. So I hope all of you, if you if you have this as a major problem around your house, look and scrape those eggs in the colder months. You can ban trees with, with uh, to catch the nymphs, but again, we do not recommend that at all. There are traps instead that you can use, and we'll talk briefly about that as well. Um, fourth, remove tree of heaven or lanthus wherever you find it, and apply insecticides as well. So check for hitchhikers. So this summer, starting now, they check your car, check on the outside near the tires, look inside your car if you can. They can hold on to cars and trucks at 60 miles an hour. And I've actually heard it's possible they can do it up to as much as 75 miles per hour. They have incredible strong grips, incredible strong legs. So they just stick onto whatever they're at and spread along our highways, right? If you see one, maybe not all of you like this, but um, Stop it, kill it, right? That's part of part of the way to control it. Some people use vacuum cleaners and shop vacs if they have huge numbers on their patios, right? It's another easy way to do that or just use a broom and fly swatter. How to destroy the egg masses, just scrape them. You can either use like a um, paint scraper or a stick or something, scrape them into a bag or container with alcohol. You can smash with a rigid card, a knife or a garden tool or rock. Um, roll with wallpaper, seam rollers I've seen or something similar, but just try to get rid of those egg masses um, out of that ecosystem there. This is what I was talking about here. These things, um, while they work to stop the nymphs crawling up trees, as you could see with that white breasted nuthatch, 
they get stuck. A lot of birds creep up and, and land on tree trunks, um, like woodpeckers. This is a horrible way for these birds to die. Sometimes they sit out there for days and they're being cooked slowly in the sun. Please do not put these sticky traps. If, if you do it, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm pleading you not to, but if you do it, you have to put some kind of wire guard or screen around it. I just do not think it's worth the potential killing a bird or um, flying, baby flying squirrels I've heard have been stuck on them and died as well. Um, it's just not worth it. And there are better ways to control them as well. So please don't use these sticky traps. This is the best one. Um, I'm going to start there. If you're interested, you can see in the bottom there, there's an, uh, pencil, uh, Penn State extension tells you how to build what's called a circle trap. If you don't want to write down or have the ability now to write down the uh, link there, you can just Google uh, spotted lanternfly circle trap. And there's a lot of really good, easy um, sort of instructions on in how to build them. So this trap is incredibly effective and it will not kill other non-targeted wildlife like birds, um, but even other beneficial insects that are native, it, it doesn't target them. It dramatically reduces those um, chances to capture other creatures. It's made from cla uh, plastic coated um, sort of insect screens that form a tunnel that the uh, spotted lanternfly walks into, and then it ends into this little collection container. And um, there is a commercial source that's already made, but it's super simple to make. Um, I've made them. If I can make it, any of you can make it. Trust me, I'm not super good at constructing things. And it, it, we've done it at Beechwood and it works incredibly well. As I've already mentioned, if you have Tree of Heaven on your property, remove it, right? Now, um, and it's also known as the Lanthus, it is a major, major invasive species. There is literally nothing good about Tree of Heaven. It stinks when you rip it open. It smells like rotting peanut butter, and that's being kind, I guess. It is super difficult to control. If you cut it down, it's like Medusa. It'll send up other sprouts. You cut those down, it sends up twice as many more. Um, so cutting and mowing is ineffective. What you have to do is control the root system so you can apply a systemic herbicide at the optimum time of the year, which is July and September, right? Um, first thing you do, and again, we tried as much as humanly possible to stay away from herbicides, but I will tell you, sometimes the major challenges and major invasive species, that's the only option you have. And there's three different application methods. You can, um, what's known as foliar, you can spray them. Um, but the best, right, there's um, what's called basal bark, suitable up to six inches. The best is really what we call hack and squirt. So for the larger trees, all you simply do is take a hatchet, you hit into at an angle into the tree. So there's a little opening between the bark and the wood. You spray a little bit of herbicide in there. It absorbs it into the tree and the root system and kills it that way. Um, allow roughly 30 days for it to take effect. The tree will die and then you can cut the tree down. The wood is not great, it's garbage, right? Um, you can use either Roundup, which is uh, glyphosate or uh, Triclopyr, which is a little bit more toxic. Um, but, but the Roundup you can easily get from uh, some big box store and you don't use it in any huge numbers. I usually in the larger ones will use maybe six or seven different uh, hacks into it and it, it seems to work. So if you see them coming back, you just monitor and retreat as necessary. We do not advise insecticides, right? Only recommended in extreme infestation. And that is when you call on a professional because a lot of the stuff required to actually kill it is extremely toxic. So um, only use insecticides with EPA registration. You'll often end up killing a lot of other beneficial species like ladybugs and uh, monarchs and a whole host of other things that are we're losing. And so it's not a really great way to do it. Um, so just think of those repercussions and home remedies are not recommended, right? So again, here is the time frame that we can see here. Um, for controlling them. Um, really what you want to do though is essentially um, the first two professionals will do the latter three on there. So what is PA doing to control the spotted lantern fly? And everybody's like, well, it doesn't seem like they're doing much, right? No, they've been working very, very hard, quite honestly, 
Um, and here are some of the agencies from the USDA to Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, which um, when I just came back into the uh, United States from Canada, they do a very thorough job of inspecting anything. So if you have plants, they're going to look quite closely at it. And most of the time, you're not even allowed to bring that stuff into the U.S. Um, PA, Department of Agriculture, and of course, Penn State Extension does a lot um, doing either research or working with the public to inform them on how to control them. So um, they have been keeping it relatively under control. So honestly, they've been quite effective, more so than uh, originally thought, quite honestly. They've been funding for research and management and eradicating tree of heaven across the state. They have been uh, along highways and railroad lines, leaving what we call trap trees. So once these other tree of heaven is killed, they, they all basically, to use a bird thing, flock to that tree and then they bait it with insecticide. So it is having actually very, very good effects within the state. Some of my last things here, and then I'll open it up to questions here. And here's where the positive news, I've given you some stuff with the good news about the two parasitic wasps from China and that native fungus that was killing them. Um, as expected here, we are seeing much larger numbers in Allegheny County than previous years, and we've always expected that. I, we think within the next three years, you're going to see the peak of numbers of spotted lanternfly in Allegheny County. Then, of course, um, in the surrounding counties, peaking probably five to maybe even eight years in the sort of uh, periphery counties around the greater Pittsburgh metropolitan area. But this is the great news. The current research shows that spotted lanternflies are not a substantial threat to our ecosystem like we first thought. It's not the apocalypse. If anything, it's just going to be a large annoyance like the brown marmorated stink bug was, with the exception if you're a grape um, you know, farmer or if you're into the grape industry, which I maybe some of you are, but that doesn't seem to be a major thing here in our part of Western PA. Where the spotted lanternfly first emerged in Berks County, we think is as um, as early as maybe 2009 to 2011, they had mostly disappeared from Berks County last year. They seem to some type of equilibrium. So whether it's, I suspect it's birds, but also the impacts that people in the area have been doing to scrape the egg masses, kill tree of heaven, um, all of those types of things have made them essentially disappear from Berks County, or they were in substantially smaller numbers than they had been in years past. So that's great news because we think that is probably what's going to also happen here in Western PA. Already, as I mentioned, right, they're only known to harm tree of heaven, grape vines, and black walnut saplings. Even then, the termination of uh, their feeding um, or death from spotted lanternfly feeding is not a common occurrence, even for those species, which they prefer. It's, a, uh, it's feeding as a stressor, may cause yelling and wilting and some die back, but otherwise healthy trees will rebound without any lasting harm. And then lastly here, management recommendations from Penn State and county environmental groups, including uh, Audubon, like us, continue to be supportive of circle traps, like I showed from Penn State, not the sticky traps, right? Um, squishing them any chance you get and vacuuming. And we do not, like them, recommend sticky traps at all. Any contact insecticides or other home remedies. People were using pine saw, but that can cause a lot of other secondary problems that are maybe even worse than a spot and lanternfly. So that, that's, I think, pretty good news as we've learned more about them. Once we get these brachinoid wasps, these parasitic wasps out there, that should also play a substantial role in getting their numbers down. So what do you do if you're out of this quarantine area in Pennsylvania or even out of state? Um, this is important. Collect it if you can. Let's say you're in the northern Potter County of Pennsylvania, which is outside the um, quarantine area. Collect it. Put it into a container either filled with alcohol or something to kill it and preserve it or take a good picture of it. And then you can report it here to the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture or the Penn State Extension at uh, the number, and you can see there, one eight 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 four bad fly, right? And that's the rest of the number there. Um, it's important because when they find out where these uh, spotted lanternflies are emerging in the non-quarantine areas, they can get up there and try to slow it down. It's, it's eventually gonna spread, but that's the key thing here. We're not gonna stop it initially. We're gonna slow down the spread to find the solutions to help bring it back here, right? 
um, could uh, in the next few years, and you'll see add additional municipalities to the quarantine area. And if you find any life stage that spotted lanternfly in a municipality where it is already known to exist, no need to call, right? Allegheny County or Butler or Beaver or Westmoreland, just kill it, right? So that is my presentation on the most updated information on the spotted lanternfly. Like I said, good news that while it's going to be annoying here this summer and into the fall and for the next few years, if you're going to a Pirates game here in the next few months uh, and you're going to watch our great new picture that we have, right, you're, you're going to have to deal with spotted lanternflies on top of it, not only the opposing fans. So 